Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagam Radian aboard USS Gerald R. Ford, the United States Navy's newest supercarrier uh, on trials off the Virginia coast. And it's our absolute honor to be talking to the commanding officer of America's uh, great new uh, warship, J.J. Yank Cummings, Captain, United States Navy commanding officer of Gerald R. Ford. Sir, thanks so much for being such an exceptional host for us today. Uh, you've shown uh, us uh, and your entire team uh, from the XO Command Master Chief to the great public affairs officers you've got working for you have done a tremendous job for us. So I wanted to thank you. And also, best cookies, I think, in the fleet, although that's uh, likely to spark uh, debate and absolutely uh, great lunch. Uh, when you took this job, a lot of your best friends even said, that's the end of your career, Yank. Uh, boy, you know, all these problems with this ship. From your standpoint, what did you see? What are you seeing? What's the progress you guys have made uh, in the last uh, 15 months in particular to get this ship ready to, you know, because you're trailblazing not just Ford, but all the Ford class ships that are to come, whether it's Kennedy, Enterprise, Miller, and beyond. So not necessarily end of my career, but a challenge to the career. Uh, a lot of folks, when they heard I was coming here, it was like, good luck, you've got a, a mess, you've heard all the critics about the ship. And then when I checked on board, I come to find out the critics were wrong. This ship is fantastic, the crew is fantastic, and the, all the stuff I read about the Ford before coming out here was incorrect. You know, our systems are spot on, we're coming along great post uh, PSA, uh, the repairs done at that event have proven to be successful. We've had zero issues with our propulsion. We are AMOLs and AEG currently working great. Our dual band radar is working great. And more importantly, our crew is excited to be out here to be doing this historic event, this aircraft compatibility testing, pretty much the first and last time for the Ford class. It's been spectacular. So you know, the crew is excited and uh, you know, we are ready to prove the critics wrong every day we do so, and I'm excited to keep doing that as a commanding officer leading these fine young men and women, to, which is true, the true heart and soul of our ship, which is the crew members of sailors. Um, and how do you keep folks motivated, right? Because you've also had a lot of plank owners, which can be very, very good, but sometimes not as good because some of those folks will say like, oh boy, you know. Um, you know, t talk to us a little bit about how you keep a crew motivated because this is kind of drudge work, right? It's not a formal deployment. There are some guys who have been assigned to the ship now for seven years uh, and, and it's tough on the crew as well. So how do you keep that morale going, especially as you're trying to ramp up uh, capability? Absolutely. So sure, plank owner has been here some six, seven years and been through a lot of uncertainty and schedule. Of late, our schedule's solidified, and we're finding the last 400 ways we've left on time and come back on time each time, which has been great for morale. Young sailors check in, and our focus is, you talk about improving morale, so thinking about deployment, thinking about how we're going to get the ship in the high seas and go iron out some of the systems, which we don't know really how to do that yet because we haven't had a chance to embark an entire air wing. So the morale on us is to ensure they are focused on the mission, which is getting ready for deployment, thinking about deployment, getting our tactics, techniques, procedures together, our SOPs or standing operating procedures ready to get the ship ready for deployment. So it's about a deployment mindset, not a shipyard hard hat mentality. It's an underway going on the big blue on the high seas and bringing the fight to the enemy. And we talk about that a lot uh, with our crew. Um, talk to us a little bit, you know, there was, you've got 2,200 ships company, about 500 riders aboard, whether it's from NAVC, Huntington Ingalls, uh, General Atomics, Raytheon, and a, a myriad of other contractors that are key to the ship. Talk to us a little bit about whether, because there's concern that when the air wing comes aboard, there'll be about 100 berths short. Lean manning can work, lean manning can also be a challenge, especially for sustainability. Where are you on that? Do you have the right number of people to do the jobs? that they're going to have to do because at the end of the day you could have a low artificially low number but at the end sailors are working harder and that's really really a problem over a long deployment sure well sailors we always work hard first and foremost that's part of what we do second we have a great foundation our crew is fantastic they're hard work and motivated so we have a number established and we're going to see over the next year or so we got to do some tweaking to make sure it's right but we feel the foundation is solid uh, the motivation of our sailors is sound and solid, and we'll over the next you know year we'll see is the manning numbers right? Can we make a few tweaks here? Do we need folks here or in other areas? So that's something that we're still working on, and we'll find out just make sure that how that'll come through with the, with the embarked air wing operations in a few months. We'll put it all together and make it right. Um, Self-sustainment is something that's very important to the Navy. You're going to be away and forward. You're not always going to have contractors who are going to be aboard. Um, where are you on that self-sustainment uh, capability? Uh, because unique ships in the past, for example, Enterprise, developed an entire self-sustainment capability that actually became a fleet-wide capability. Where are you on building those skill sets aboard to sustain propulsion, to sustain radars, emails, uh, arresting gear? Always a work in progress. So we just don't know quite 
what the numbers are going to be for parts we need. So this next year will determine that. So it's all about the ability to self-repair. Technical manuals in hand, parts in hand, parts on board the ship so we can be on the high seas and not have to call a technical assist to come out and fix something. So we are working with the program office, with the folks in uh, the Pentagon and uh, D.C. area to get the right list out of parts of desired technical manuals. So it's coming along. It's a slow process because we've got to make sure we do it right the first time. And it's always a challenge. And, but we're pushing hard to ensure that we're getting the right word out, the message out to what we need to make sure we are able, able to self-repair and self-sustain for a lengthy deployment. Um, talk to us about designing the uh, air wing of the future. Each class of ship has a different air wing composition. You're building an entirely new composition air wing. From your standpoint as a seasoned naval aviator and an F-14 driver uh, by trade, uh, even though you did transition to F-18s and fly them as well, um, how does that air wing, what, what's that foundational sketch look like at this point? Because the ship offers a lot of capability. You know, talk to us about the dynamic and where you guys are on that, on that wing design concept. Sure. Sticking with the foundation theme, we are better equipped to take the airway of the future because of our design. We are designed lighter. Our catapults and rescue gear can catch aircraft that are super light, also very heavy. We're designed to catch aircraft that we have not designed or built yet. So as far as future potential, it's on board the ship because we have the ability to flex um, our catapults and rescue gear. Additionally, our ready rooms. We uh, have these flex deck, um, flex room mentalities, mission bays, we can change mission bays to what we need to fit this air wing of the future. So if you think about the future of the air wing, it's on this ship, the Center of Innovation and in Navy, USS Gerald Out Ford, and we're ready for the next step of either unmanned, uh, F-35, other unknown systems. We're ready to adapt to that because it's super flexible and be able to, to make those modifications very quickly. And uh, talk to us a little bit about what this deck is like compared to a Nimitz, because everything about it is different. And when you move an island, whether it was on the Forrestal class, uh, eventually to the Kitty Hawks, and then uh, over uh, to the Nimitz, uh, and then Enterprise being its own thing, everything changes about flow. Talk to us about flow on this flight deck, because you have incredible features that actually will allow you very high sortie generation rates. Yeah, I can't speak to the Forrestal class. You probably saw it because you're much older than I am. So, um, but Thanks. Well, well, well done. Well done. I'm, I'm class of uh, 89, so. Oh, all right. No comment there. But uh, all right, flight deck design. That is truly the, the most innovative part about our ship. With the island being further aft, the acreage in front of the island gives us great flexibility. And if you talk to the designers years ago, they talked to the folks from NASCAR how to best build a pit row, but with naval aviation in mind. So the way what that design allows us with a little bigger flight deck, with our in-deck fueling stations and the locations of our weapons elevators, where we should find, as we bring the air wing on board here this year, that we can quickly um, spot, maintain, reload, refuel aircraft get into the catapult much quicker based on the, the unique design uh, of our flight deck. So we're excited to get that chance to really prove to see how, how fast we can push because it is very unique to our ship and uh, Nimbus class doesn't have this design layout that we do. So we're looking forward to those challenges ahead. Um, uh, talk to us about how she drives because she has auto throttles. Uh, thanks for the honor of, uh, of uh, 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 driving the ship uh, briefly. Uh, thankfully, the nearest contact was 24 miles away, so I couldn't do a lot of damage. Uh, but uh, talk to us a little bit about how she drives because she's got automatic throttles, and that's just an entire other dimension of ship control. Sure. Uh, yes, we're very safe. I made sure the contacts were at least 20 miles away when you're on the helm, so I appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, the ship drives amazingly. We are, so we're a little light right now. We don't have all of our gas on board, all of our weapons. So we're a little lighter, which gives us a certain, uh, a better turn rate. But as far as the engines are concerned, with the way that they were built, it's amazing to watch the ship quickly accelerate, quickly decelerate in a, in a, fa a, a fashion, which I haven't seen on Nimbus class. It's fantastic. So we were able to show on sea trials, we went from all ahead flank, which is the fast we can go on the ship, to all back emergency and stop the ship in four, uh, four ship lengths, which is unheard of for an aircraft carrier. So it's amazing, uh, one example of the, you know, the tons of technology that's built, baked into the ship that shows that uh, it's coming through as we get it on the high seas and get to exercise it. And, and really, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned that. What does that massive, you have a more than 100 megawatts of power. I mean, the Nimitzes are just tapped out when it comes to power. Sure. What does all that power mean? And then I have one last uh, follow-up question. Sure. Sure, it's power and weight, actually, and space. Sure, Nimitz class, of course, uh, that uh, electron, electrics plant, electric plant was designed back in the 60s and 70s. It is at mass capacity, and I it was a challenge when I was Exxon and Nimitz to work through that. Our uh, electric plant has excess capacity to bring on new weapon systems, and we're designed lighter. The ship is designed lighter to allow more weight to be added to our ship, so future weapon systems can be brought on board. Our ship won't impact 
the stability of the, of the vessel and also the power to do that. If you put a, a new high power uh, weapon system on a Nimbus class, it's going to be challenged to create the power from the plant. On four class, it's not a concern because we have so much excess capacity for, um, for power. And uh, I, I strangely think you're from uh, New England. Uh, I, I, could, I could tell that. Uh, I'm very sorry about the Patriots, but what do you think? Next year, where are we going to be on Patriots? And where are we going to be Where are we going to be on the Red Sox? Because I think that you guys it got that taste of winning, and there's an anticipation, right? So talk to us. So I knew I should have not, not taken this interview because of questions like that. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, the, the Patriots took a bit of my soul losing to Miami and then to the Titans, but uh, they deserve to lose. And Tom Brady, I am not sure if he asked for a five-year contract. The guy's like 57 years old, so he's probably not ready to be a quarterback until 60. So I don't know. I just want a mobile young quarterback that can roll out more than two inches and maybe add some, flex, you know, some uh, adaptability, like our ship, to, uh, to an offense. So it's something I'm looking forward to. That was that, that, Yank, man, that was, that, was, that was an excellent segue. Sir, thanks very much. Thanks so much for hosting all of us. Fairwinds following seas on what you guys are trying to do. I look forward to visiting with you again yeah. as you build this capability. Our pleasure. Come back anytime. We're glad to have you on board today. Come back anytime. I'd like to share you, our, you know, with uh, your ship and more importantly, our crew. You get a chance to eat with the officers next time. Well, you can eat with our sailors, but that's the best part of the ship is our crew. Let me, let me ask, actually, good follow-up on that, good segue on that. Our Ford, you know, you've got Ford sailors who are now going to Kennedy, who are then going to be going to Enterprise. Is this going to be something which is actually going to be a career field, that there are folks who become Ford-class sailors and stay in that community and end up building it? Have to. It makes sense, sense monetarily. Why would we train a sailor to come uh, exercise and use these systems, which are unique only to this class, and then send them to a Nimitz class and have to start over? Because you'll basically be a ship rider uh, for a year while you get trained up on a system which you have no idea how to operate. So it makes financial sense to keep the Ford class sailors properly identified to keep them rolling through Ford class carriers because it saves us a tremendous amount of money with the experience that they develop. So, you know, for instance, bringing a Nimitz class sailor on board our ship in certain departments is a complete waste of time because it will take them six to seven months to figure out our catapults, our arresting gear, how we do our weapons elevators, our nuclear, our nuclear operators sim similarly. So it makes no sense to cross the deck them from the di different class because it's a waste of money. So I'm looking forward to getting that Ford class um, uh, bench built up that we can start cross-checking between each other and make us more, more viable in the fleet. Captain J.J. Yank Cummings, Commanding Officer, USS Gerald R. Ford. Sir, honor and pleasure. Thanks so much and look forward to seeing you again soon. Hopefully, Hayes Gray and underway. Hurrah. Well, glad to have you back. All right, have a good day. Thanks.